Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome back to another person word study. We're going to go over the book of Kings, Chronicles, and Job. I'm pretty excited because God showed me something pretty amazing in Job, but I'm not going to get ahead of myself. So I always like to do an outline of why we're doing these studies together. Um, people like to say God in three persons. God the Father is a person, Jesus is a person, and the Holy Spirit's a person. And so far as we've gone through here, a person is somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. And sometimes it can be talking about the flesh, the body, emphasizing the body part of the body, uh, oh yeah, uh, body, soul, and spirit. It's emphasizing the body, but it's still referring to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit, as we'll see in this study. So if you want to turn to 2 Kings, it's only mentioned, I see, twice, and it's in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 6 and 7, but we're going to start at verse 1. So it's always good to have your Bible open. I'm a King James Bible believer, which means that I believe that God, when he said, heaven and earth shall not pass away, but no, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It said that in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in the book of John, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. It's not possible if we don't have a perfect written word today in English, and it's the King James Bible. So, chapter 10, verse 6, or I'm sorry, we're going to start at verse 1. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. It's important to remember 70, the word, the amount 70. And Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to, to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor. Look even out the best look even out the best and meatiest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. Remember, there's seventy sons. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. Now then shall we stand? In other words, he took out two kings. So, um, they're scared of him. doesn't matter what king they put on there, shall we stand? And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers up of the children, sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants, and will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make any king, do thou that which is good in thine eyes. They make a king. Uh, might be out of context a little bit, but they're going to make, if they make, they're scared if they make a king, Jehu's going to come in and destroy him. He's already destroyed two other kings. Um, so basically they're bound down to this Jehu saying, we're going to be your servants. Verse 6, Then he wrote a letter to the, the second time to them, saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now the king's sons, being seventy persons, the first time person is mentioned in Second Kings, and it's not mentioned in First Kings, were with the great men of the city which brought them up. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slew seventy persons, second time it's mentioned, and put their heads in baskets and sent him and sent him them to Jezreel. And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. All right. If you've watched some of the old studies that I've done before, the gates are usually where judgment happens, and it's where the marketplace is. Everybody comes through there. They want to buy and sell. Things need to be judged. It's at the gate of the city. It's like, it's like the center of attention, basically. And that's of the city. And that's why he's telling them to throw it there. Verse 9. And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? Know now that there shall fall into the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. 
So Jehu slew all the remaining of the house of Ahab and Jezreel, and all his great men, and his kinsfolk, and his priests, until he left him none remaining. Prophecy that was fulfilled. But we go back to verse 7, or 6 and 7. Okay? Persons. Okay? 70 persons. Who's the 70 persons referring to? If you go back up to verse 1, and Ahab had 70 sons. The 70 persons it's talking about is the 70 sons. What do sons have? Body, soul, and spirit. They're living. So context here, person is talking about somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit, and it's referring to the 70 sons. Okay. So now we're going to go, that's all that's in book, the book of Kings. Now we're going to jump over to 2 Chronicles 19.7. Only time it's mentioned in, in Chronicles. Second Chronicles 19. So not first Chronicles. <laughs> Second Chronicles 19. We'll get there. Verse 7, but we're going to read 4 to 9. Right. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. And I point my finger up because judges is the important thing to remember here for what we're doing. And said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Okay. This is a side note. But remember, the New Testament says, Believe not at every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they are of God. Okay? We are to judge according to this book right here. Right here it's talking about, He set judges over them and said, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, they're judging for the Lord, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Kind of like when we preach the gospel, we preach against sin. We preach that we're all sinners that we're all worthy of hell, and that we're on our way to hell. Okay, that's judgment. And preaching that if you reject Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world, and he'll pay for your sins if you come to the cross, if you reject that, we tell people, if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. You know what that's called? Judgment. Where do we get that judgment? The Bible. The Bible says, uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay? We are to make judgments, but spiritual judgments, and we're to make judgments according to the Word of God. Okay? We're not judging for man. These guys aren't judging for man. Okay? Um... We're to have grace, don't get me wrong, I kind of went off on a side part, but the important thing here is they're judging for men, uh, for God, not for men. When we tell people that they're sinners, we're not doing it because we're trying to judge for ourselves, saying, ha-ha, that person's a sinner. We're judging spiritual judgment, saying you're a sinner, and you need Jesus Christ. God said we're all part of the ministry of reconciliation. You need Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ can reconcile you to God the Father. There's one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. If you're lost out there, you need Jesus Christ. It always gets on my nerves when people try to say that um, you shouldn't really preach on hell when you're preaching the gospel. You really shouldn't preach on sin when you're preaching the gospel. I mean, take a light attitude towards sin. Don't be hardcore about it. Okay? Sin is a serious thing. That's why Jesus died on the cross, because of your sin, because of my sin, and it and the world as a whole. Okay? You want Jesus to pay for your sins? You go to the cross. You reject Jesus Christ, you're going to have to pay for your own sins at the white throne judgment before Jesus Christ. And he's going to cast you into hell. And then to the lake of fire. Okay? But that's a side note, but right here, notice that it's important to know that they're supposed to be judging for the Lord, not for men. Verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect 
respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. There's our word person. Moreover, in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. Another side sidetracking. Do you realize that when people's when the Bible says that that the man of let's see uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now these Bible perversions don't like the word that he may be perfect. Because they're looking at the sin side. I can't be perfectly sinless. Neither can you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Nobody can. But notice what it says here. And with a perfect, in verse 9, with a perfect heart. Your heart can be perfect before God. King David was called a man after God's own heart. Your heart can be perfect. You're still going to fail, you're still going to fall into sin and temptation, but your heart can be perfect with the Lord. In other words, your desire to follow the Word of God, your sorrow in your heart when you sin against God, falling on your knees and repenting right away, okay? Um, even if it takes a little bit, you repent and you struggle with sin, but it's that heart, your heart's for the Lord. Your heart can be perfect with the Lord. But we go back to verse 7 where it says, God is not a respecter of persons, nor a respecter of persons. Okay? Now, when it says that, not a respecter of persons, it's talking about a human being considered with respect to the living body or corporal existence only. And some will say, well, you see, you see, it's not talking about body, soul, and spirit. It's just talking about the body. Okay? Corporal, have corporeal, if I can say it right, having a body consisting of a material body material opposed to spiritual or immaterial but it's still talking about a human I hate the word human mankind is a better word uh, mankind men women and children uh, men and women um, in this context men and women children are innocent till they get to the age of decision then they're considered a young lady or a young man okay young woman now it's still referring to somebody who has a body soul and spirit but it's emphasizing the body side. It's wanting the body side to stick out more. So it's talking about it doesn't matter if you're beautiful or ugly, rich or poor, smart or, I don't know how to say it, but dumb, because I've been dumb sometimes. It doesn't matter what you are on the outside and the body and everything. God's not a respecter of persons. He looks at the heart, and he'll always look at the heart. We've seen a lot of videos, our videos. I've had a lot of videos where it keeps coming back, it always comes back to the heart. So a person here is still referring to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit, but it's emphasizing the body side of the person, body, soul, and spirit. You can't get away from that. Okay? If you're saying God the Father, and I know a lot of people, and I've said this a lot, but this might be the first video someone comes across. A lot of people say God the Father is a person and the Holy Spirit's a person. And then when you hit them up and say, you believe God the Father has a body, soul, and spirit of his own? Because they say God in three persons. Like they, they, they fall for the Trinity terms instead of sticking with the Bible terms. And they'll tell you flat out, I don't believe God the Father has a body, soul, and spirit. Are you crazy? But then why are you saying person? Why are you saying God the Father is a person? The Bible always says a person has a body, soul, and spirit. And now as we're learning, as we go through it, sometimes the body can be emphasized. And this is important for Job. I don't want to jump ahead. God showed me something pretty amazing, brothers and sisters of Christ. So, 2 Chronicles 19.7, it is referring to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. So, now we're getting to the book of Job. Job's always difficult for me. There's a lot of stuff to get out of it, but there's a lot of stuff that, you know, wiser men that God has chosen and called, like uh, Brother Brian and King James Video Ministries, Peter Ruckman, they have great studies on, you know, Book of Job and everything uh, as a reflection of someone who's in the time of Jacob's trouble, a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. So, Nehemiah, no person, word person. Esther, 
I think that's Esther. Yeah. No mention of the word person. So we get all the way to Job 13. Job 13, we're going to start at 5. Hopefully you're following along. Verse 13, we're going to start at 5. Okay, 5, and we're going to go to 13. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Okay. Side note on that one, because I like reading this, because like I said, when you do word studies or you do um, expository studies, you're going to come across stuff and you're going to be like, I got to share it, I got to share it. Okay. Hold your peace and it should be your wisdom. I did a recent study on Paul's testimony and he tells King Agrippa, I pray that, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have every verse memorized, uh, I pray that you hear me patiently. Okay. What that means is he's asking King Agrippa, before you make a decision, before you speak and judge, hear me out completely. Okay. So hold your peace and it should be your wisdom. Uh, verse 6, hear now my reasoning and hearken to my pleading of my lips. Okay, there's times where we're going to have wisdom without when we listen. I learned so much as a baby Christian when I first got saved by listening, not speaking. So he's basically saying, listen to me, it's important. Verse 7, will ye speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Here's the cool verse right here. Will ye accept his person? Will ye contend for God? Is it good that he should search you out, or as one man mocketh another, do ye so mock him? We're going to go to 13. He will surely reprove you if ye do secretly accept persons. Shall not his excellency make you afraid and his dread fall upon you? Your remembrance, remembrances are like unto ashes, your body is to bodies of clay, hold your peace, let me alone, that I may speak, and let come on me what will. Okay, persons mentioned twice in this one. Okay. Make sure I read the row. Will ye accept his person? Who's the his referring to there? God. Okay. Will ye speak wickedly for God? He's talking about God, and talk to the verse seven, and talk deceitfully for Him. Are you going to speak for Him and do wrong? There's a lot of people out there saying they're men of God and they're teaching heresies, doctrines of devils, false gospels, post-trib, replacement theology. You can lose your salvation. Uh, you can use any Bible. They're against the King James Bible being God's perfect written word. You know, and. Uh, Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for Him, saying, I, I represent Jesus Christ. I'm an ambassador. The Bible talks about how we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Will you accept His person? Will you contend for God? His person. Get a hold of that. Now, a lot of these Trinity people will turn around and say, it's talking about God the Father. Let's go turn real quick to Hebrews 1.3. I'm going to stay where we are. Turn to Hebrews 1.3. Who being the brightness of his glory. Who's the who there? Jesus Christ being the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God the Father. His glory is talking about his there is God the Father. And the glory it's talking about is Jesus being the glory of God the Father. The next part. And, and the expressed image of his person. Jesus is the person, is the image of the person of God the Father. But notice it says of His person. What does it say here? His person. This is referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person of the Godhead. I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, that is so amazing. Uh, another verse 
that's talking about how Jesus is a, is the person of the Godhead. Body, soul, and spirit dwell, dwell in him, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. These three are one. I still have brothers out there doing teachings, and he keeps slipping up and saying, in, in, in. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach in. It's not three in one. It's these three are one. Okay? In is something you put in. You can. That's how the Trinity gets the Trinity, three in one. They take God and say, God the Father is in it, Jesus Christ is in it, and the Holy Spirit is in it. Three in one. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches these three are one. Jesus is the only person of the Godhead. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And remember, um, Job is an example of someone in the time of Jacob's trouble. And a lot of people aren't going to accept Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, first, what is it? Uh, I think it's first and second Peter where it talks about how um, well, the Antichrist is going to show up in the time of Jacob's trouble claiming to be Jesus. There's going to be a lot of people trying to pull people away from the real Jesus Christ, and they're not going to accept him. So, person here is a reference to Jesus Christ. But it's also a reference to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ has God the Father in him, the soul. Jesus is the body. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit. Remember. In context, when it says his person here, it's talking about a human being considered with respect to the living body or corporeal existence only. Corporeal, once again, has a, is having a body. It's emphasizing the physical. And who's the image, as we read in Hebrews, of the Godhead? Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Second time it's mentioned, uh, if you do secretly accept persons, Okay. It's talking about, uh, once again, the outward showing of if you accept somebody that, you know, is rich over poor, uh, good looking over ugly, you know, someone who's fair. Um, you look at the thing about Saul and King David. Um, the reason they chose Saul, because uh, God chose Saul, but you know what I'm saying, he was very strong and good to look at. And that's why they looked at him and said, hey, he's a king, when God was their king and they rejected God as being king, kind of like they rejected Jesus Christ as being their king, who is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. Is God the, the image of God the Father? So both times here, it's talking about body, soul, and spirit, when it says person. That's the context. Okay. Let's jump down to Job 22, 29. Job 22, 29. Um, going back for something. Job chapter 22, and we will start in verse 17. 17, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Okay, this is going down through a list of what God Almighty can do for them. Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Okay. You want to make sure to be careful, I'd throw that one in, about um, not falling for the counsel of the wicked. That's why a lot of us will tell you and push, brother and sisters of Christ, you come across somebody's YouTube page, a ministry that you think is great, if they teach a false gospel, it doesn't matter if they're on right on with the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, eternal security. If they teach a false gospel, stay away from them. The counsel of the wicked, stay away from them. They could teach the true gospel, which is not really likely. Uh, most everybody I've come across, um, if they're off there, they're off a lot. But um, if they teach a true gospel, but they teach a post-trib or mid-trib, which I haven't seen that, where they, they usually just go hand in hand. When they teach a true gospel, they teach, uh, sorry, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. But they teach post-trib, stay away from them. 
They can be right on other things, but if they teach that you can lose your salvation in this dispensation, not the time of Jacob's trouble, I have brothers in Christ that teach, and I, I believe it too, and I teach that you can lose your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? If you take the mark of the beast, you go to hell. There's no forgiveness. You can't cut your hand off and say, I, I repent and cut your hand off and go to heaven. It doesn't work. You take the mark and worship the beast. They go hand in hand. You go to hell. But in this dispensation, if they're teaching that it's works and that you can lose your salvation, stay away from them. Avoid the counsel of the wicked. Now we're going to jump down to verse 29. Remember, this is talking about what God, which saith unto God, depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? So verse 29, that's the verse that has the word person. When men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there is lifted up, and he shall save the humble person. Okay. Humble person. What's the opposite of humble? Prideful. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. You can get prideful, and you can drop your pride and humble yourself, and God can save you. Uh, the biggest example is salvation. But even as a Christian, you know, when we get prideful, we're heading for destruction. If we drop that pride, God can save us from the destruction that was coming because of our pride. Uh, you have to drop your pride and self-righteousness and come before God as a sinner, having sorrow for sinning against God. Then God can save you. Then you believe in Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross. He died for your sins. He died for my sins brothers and sisters in Christ, and if anybody that comes to the cross, he'll die for your sins. But you have to repent. You have to drop that pride. Why? So God can save you. You have to humble yourself. You can't come to the cross and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I'm not that bad. I'm good. I'm a great person. I do great things. I'm not as bad as that person over there. That's pride. God won't save you if you have pride. So, he can save the humble person. What is the definition of person there? Someone who has a body, soul, and spirit. He saved me. I have a body, soul, and spirit. And brothers and sisters in Christ that are Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, he saved you. Do you have a body, soul, and spirit? So, it's a reference to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. Turn to Job 32. Job 32, 21. Actually, we're going to read 20 to 22. So we're going to start in verse 20. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. This is important, how it separates um, person from the word title. Okay. Unto any man, verse 22, For I know not to grieve flattering titles, and so doing my Maker would soon take me away. Man's person there. Okay, a human being considering with respect to the living body. Talk about somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit, but once again it's emphasizing the outward appearance. Okay? Good looking versus ugly, I always throw that in there. Poor versus rich. Famous versus someone who's not well known. Okay, favoritism basically, not a respecter of persons. But the other important thing to throw in there is neither let me give flattering titles unto man. How many people like to go out there and have titles? Doctor so-and-so. Um, uh, pastor so-and-so. Pastor is a description. It's not a title. You should never, ever walk up to someone and say, Hey, Pastor Bob, how's it going? That's a title. You don't do that. It's Brother Bob or it's Bob. You know what I'm saying? You don't use titles. But how many, who uses mostly the titles today? What false religion has tons of titles today? Flattering titles. The Catholic Church. You have priests. You have Jesuits. You've got fathers and all those other titles. 
okay, because they love flattering titles. Person there is referenced, reference, I get out, referencing someone who has a body, soul, and spirit, but emphasizing the body again, the outward showing. You're not supposed to be a respecter of someone just because it's such and such. Now, I have to throw this in there real quick. I didn't do it earlier. When you have two people that are doing right, you're not supposed to respect one over the other because one has more money and this one's poor. They're both sinning the same sin. You need to come down on both of them equally. Correcting them both in Scripture and telling them both how to overcome that sin. You don't have a lighter attitude towards sin towards this person because they're your best friend over this person you don't really know that well. You know what I'm saying? You're not supposed to be a respecter of persons. Now, if someone over here is falling into sin and temptation, and you go to correct them, they don't want anything to do with you, and you go over to this person that's doing the same sin, and you go to correct them, and they listen to you, and they have sorrow in their heart, you stay and you deal with this person. It's not because you're showing respect to this person more than this person, it's this person didn't want to hear it. This person didn't. There's a difference there, because some people will try to hold that to somebody. Respect or persons has to do with unequal treatment, how you treat somebody. Judgment, as we saw in the Old Testament so far, a lot of the judges were not supposed to be a respecter of persons. So, body, soul, and spirit, emphasizing the flesh, the outward showing of somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. And it's funny because when they try to say God is a person and they try to use that, it's like you're still saying God the Father has a body, a fleshly body. So, Job 34, a couple chapters down, Job 34, verse 19. Uh, we're going to start at 18, sorry. 18. It is fit to say to a king, Thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly. It's a question. Is it fit to say to a king, Thou art wicked? And to princes ye are ungodly, they have a title, they have high standing. How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor? For they are all the work of his hands. Once again, persons of princes. How far are we going to go? Uh, 21. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight, and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeketh all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Okay. You can't hide behind titles. Well, I'm a prince. I'm the pope. I'm a priest. I'm a father, holy father. I'm the president. I'm a congressman. You know, we can go on and on and on. Okay? You can't hide behind persons of princes. Okay? What it's talking about here, um, character of office, once again, the man that is a prince, it's talking about. Um, Adventitious qualities impressed by office or station, the quality of that in a public estimation belonging to a person in a particular station. Person. It's still referring to somebody who has a body, soul, and spirit. Who can be a prince? Someone who has a body, soul, and spirit. That's who it's referring to. Now things can get perverted, and some will say anybody can be a prince. I mean, you can name your dog prince. No. When it comes to princes and kings, it's of someone who has a body, soul, and spirit. It's a man. Okay. But I also want to throw up real quick Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. And this is what it's talking about here when it's talking about um, For they are all, in verse 19, For they are all the work of his hand. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revileth the deep and secret things, he knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light that dwelleth in him. What does it say right here in verse 22? There is no darkness nor shadow of death there where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Once again, it comes back to the heart. 
God will see your heart. You can't hide it from Him. Okay? But right here, last time uh, for the book of Daniel, or not Daniel, I'm sorry, book of Job, last time person is mentioned, body, soul, and spirit. So I thought that was pretty amazing. We found a verse that's referring to Jesus Christ as being a person, of God's person, His person, talking about God. Okay. So thank you for watching this study. Uh, please pray for my eyes. I may remember asking for this way back when. I could use more prayer for my eyes. My wife and I could really use some prayer. We keep running out of water. We're really going through a drought uh, this year. Um, so we're having to keep ordering water every month. So we got rain coming, so we're just praying for some more rain and get the rain coming again. So I love all my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you're lost, you need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Time is running out. I don't want you going to hell. I don't know of any brother or sister in Christ that wants you going to hell. God doesn't want you going to hell. The Bible says that um, for His will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, people in hell don't want you in hell. Um, family members. I'm just saying, we love you enough to preach the truth to you that you're a sinner. If you come across this video and you're lost, you need to get saved. Drop the pride. Humble yourself. Come before the Lord as a broken sinner and having sorrow for sinning against God and realizing your life is a mess and it's leading you to hell. And only God can save you. You can't save yourself. And God will change your life after He saves you. So, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next person study.